This week, we talked to Richard Jurek, author of a couple of our favorite space books, The Ultimate Engineer, The Remarkable Life of NASA's visionary leader, George Lowe, and Marketing the Moon, The Selling of the Apollo Lunar Program. Plus, the incredible story of $2 bills flown in space. You don't want to miss that one, I assure you. And we'll get you up to date with all the latest news and sport from the world of space. (laughs) Please come and find us on social media. We're at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And we love hearing from you. And don't forget to hit that share button or send this to your space flight friends. But perhaps listen to it first, just in case you don't like it. But we sure hope that you enjoy episode 56 of the Space and Things Podcast. Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 56 of the Space and Things podcast. It feels like take two on this one, Emily, because uh, this was the show we technically had prepared last week, just in case there was the delay for Inspiration 4. But here we are uh, with this week's show. But um, it's been a week, hasn't it? It's been quite a week. Oh my God, so much has happened this week. It's been insane, but in a good way, in a good way. It's just been just been really nuts, but yeah. a lot is going on in the space community and we're going to talk about some of it. Yeah, we will. We'll talk all about Inspiration4 later, uh, but uh, Emily, we haven't talked about the fact you went to KSC recently. We haven't talked about your Celestius event that you did, um, and you've had a couple of articles out. You've been super busy. Yeah, I've been uh, really... Uh, keeping busy the last few weeks yeah i went to kennedy space center a couple weeks back um this is horrible and i hate admitting this i went mainly as an excuse to tr- there's this new uh hyatt in titusville <laughs> i feel horrible admitting that i basically went as an excuse to try it out just to see what it was like and um it's very nice i, I recommend it <laughs> five stars five stars but i did I, I have a yearly yeah fancy and uh, I did go to Kennedy Space Center again, and as always, it was in- just super enjoyable. I-, I always have a great time there, and I got to see Atlantis again and all my favorite stuff. So beautiful! It was a lot of fun. I had a great time. I did do a article for Celestius, and I did a live event last night. It is on their uh, page on Facebook. I did an article for them about Phil Chapman, who uh, Dr. Phil Chapman, who was the first Australian American to be selected as an astronaut. He did not, unfortunately, go to space. He w- he did leave NASA, but uh, he still had an amazing career. And the article talks about that. I got to know him a little bit, and he was really cool. So I hope people read it. Uh, I did review the book, The Burning Blue, about Challenger. Uh, it honestly is a really good read. I I know people have written a lot about challenger but it's mm. it's really good i i do recommend it i i thought the author did a really good job with it and uh yeah i did write a <laughs> i wrote an article on media that's ruffled a few feathers so <laughs> medium that ruffled a few feathers um about certain things <laughs> I, i've been up to some uh, mischief i i talked about <laughs> things that i think needed to be changed things that need to be looked at in the space community yeah, I mean, I don't think it's mischief at all. I think you told your truth and you told your story, and uh, and some people didn't like that, which is crazy. You know, it's someone else's truth, and uh, people need yeah. to learn to listen more or read more, perhaps, and 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 w- with open eyes and open ears and open minds and open hearts as well, and appreciate yeah. that uh, it's not necessarily attacking them. It's 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 yeah. just saying it as it is, and 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 letting people know that things aren't what they may have seen. Um, exactly there's other there's other ways to look at the world um we're going to put links to all those all those things and i thoroughly recommend you read in emily's medium uh article it's amazing that just quickly emily celestius who are they because i think this is really fascinating and we have we haven't touched on that yet but this is fast fascinating uh celestius actually they've been around for quite some time in, in one form or another they've been around since the 80s um, and what they do, um, originally I, they had, I think one of the first commercial launchers back in the eighties and Deke Slayton was part of the company back then, the Mercury 7 oh, wow. astronaut. I didn't know that. Yeah. And as the company, uh, went forward in the 1990s, they got into the business of the sounds crazy, but it's really not 
uh, burials in space. And they not only do that, but you can send, if you're alive, you can send up like part of your DNA into space as well. Oh, and wow. they do uh they do it in Earth orbit. They can do it to the moon. They can do it in deep space. Um, they have a lot of options. It sounds nuts, but they send part if if you pass away. Obviously, they send part of your remains, like if you're cremated. But um, people think it sounds nuts, but it's really not. The prices are actually quite reasonable, and um, really, it's not crazy if you think about it because people get buried at sea. People Absolutely. have their ashes scattered. You know maybe in one of their favorite places. So it's really not unusual. And I want to say over a thousand people have opted to have this done. So um, I'm working with them now. I'm doing, I'm doing a few blog pieces for them. One of them has already gone up and is live. And I did a live event with them last night. I don't intend to check out anytime soon. I want to make that very <laughs> clear. I, I plan on being around for as long as I can, but um, it's definitely something if you're, if you're a space nut and if you've always had a desire to go to space, but maybe you fall a little short of being a NASA astronaut. Oh, well, who knows? You don't have to be a NASA astronaut exactly. nowadays, but we'll talk a little more about that. If you can't quite make it to space, maybe you can get on one of a uh, range prearranged to get on one of these uh, memorial flights. And they're doing a bunch of them in the next couple of years as well. So my, I have another article that's coming out with them uh, soon, and it's going to be about another one of their uh, uh, participants on a heritage flight. So nice. that'll be out soon. Nice. Well, yeah, check that out. There'll be links in the show notes. Anyway, Emily, let's, let's move on to the show. Endeavor Houston, we see a nominal Miko. Ohms 1, not required. Welcome to space. And so we crack on. <laughs> oh, my God. My husband is giving me the stink eye for doing that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, dear. I, I'm never doing that again. Okay. <laughs> that is the end. That is no more. The end. Okay. This. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. Let me start over. This week, we're talking to author Richard Jurek, the author of two very fine books indeed. The first one was released in... 2014 and it is called marketing the moon the selling of the apollo lunar program which he co-wrote with david scott not that david scott um <laughs> just just wanted to make that clear it's just a coincidence and in 2019 he released a book called the ultimate engineer the remarkable life of nasa's visionary leader george lowe some of our listeners may be well acquainted with george's story and place in history but I suspect for many, he's someone who isn't as well-known compared to the likes of Christopher Kraft or Bob Gilruth. It's quite amazing that a book about George was not written before this, but we're sure glad that it's happened. Absolutely. Richard has also written articles for the Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine and was a consulting producer on the 2019 documentary Chasing the Moon, which we mentioned in our favorite documentaries episode about a year ago. Can you believe that was a year ago? But it was a year ago. I looked it, it up. Was. It was one of our early, early episodes. Crazy. That is nuts. So Richard is also an expert on coins and currencies which have been flown to space and has his own Jefferson Space Museum, which is a virtual museum showing his collection of $2 bills which have been flown to space. Now, this is actually incredible. Absolutely incredible. And the stories that he's about to tell are absolutely going to blow your mind. Seriously, listen to this all the way to the end. This interview went places I did not expect it to go. My jaw was very much dropped. I lost control, sorry. Can we copy and we know what that feels like? <laughs> first of all, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Now, um, first, let's discuss your, your book you did with David Scott, not, not the astronaut Dave Scott, right. but first, let's <laughs> discuss marketing the moon. Uh, so what kinds of things do you think the space programs, uh, I say programs because now I think we've got several of them, uh, what do you think uh, they can learn from what NASA was doing during the 1950s and 1960s? Yeah, you know, it, it's very interesting. Uh, David and I were asked to speak before COVID shut everything down, we were asked to speak uh, at NASA headquarters uh, to everyone within communications at NASA on, on this very subject. Uh, at the time, Jim Bridenstine was a huge fan of Marketing the Moon, 
Uh, he passed copies around to everybody. Bob Jacobs had read it and others had, had read it. It more as a nostalgia piece. And you had that clash of cultures, as you're familiar with, Emily, this, this, this clash between uh, the Apollo groups and then post-Apollo with shuttle folks who were saying, well, that, that was then, this is now, and we need to move forward. Uh, so we did a presentation on lessons learned from Apollo and, and really talked about the universal aspects of what they did right back during Apollo, what NASA was doing right during the shuttle, and what they could do right now and what they were doing right now. And that, that involved things like humanizing the astronauts, having the astronauts as, as the lead personalities and spokespeople for the agencies, uh, almost along the lines of your favorite sports stars and others. I mean, in the world of social media, their followings are legion. Uh, and that ability to have one-on-one -on -one or seemingly one-on-one -on -one connections with people are amazing. And just like during the Apollo days when everyone had their favorite astronaut, their favorite mission, they knew the inside stories, um, we felt it very important that uh, the selection of the astronauts uh, have that sense of humanization around it. The other thing was uh, an interesting conversation around the difference between what SpaceX and Blue Origin were doing by having chief marketing officers and people who were familiar with real-time communication in the sense of converting people and changing things with more of a government organization that has a mandate around education and communication and less conversion and less marketing in its traditional sense. Uh, and it was funny. Uh, it was sort of a deja vu moment because at the time, when we were talking to them, uh, the communications folks were saying, look, we can't get a camera on board. Every time uh, uh, Bezos or Musk launch a rocket, they have like 16 HD GoPros filming it from every angle. Uh, and once again, we come to the engineers and they go, well, you know, there wasn't a, a, a request for that. Uh, there's no room. There's no weight. It's not a priority. And the communications part, the marketing part, was pushed to the background. It was kind of uh, interesting. I don't mean to give out any inside baseball because uh, Jim's no longer at the agency, so, so I can say it. But because Dave and I were there and he really liked the book, he actually came to uh, a senior strat meeting with the communications people that we were at and presenting to. And the talk at the time was their frustration with getting the NASA logo on the rockets. And... Um, Bridenstein listened to that conversation and folks were being very animate about our need to put a label on these efforts that both SpaceX and Blue Origin were doing on behalf of NASA, but that the broader world thought private space was doing and doing on their own. There were some vocal arguments that went back and forth. And before we knew it, there was a huge emphasis through everyone across the supply chain uh, in private space NASA supported missions to get uh, the worm logo, to get the NASA meatball logo. We suddenly started to see social media posts from the contractors. Hey, look at that beautiful NASA logo. Uh, and before we knew it, that conversation had changed. So I think the big thing there was uh, not forgetting to tell their story and to keep the communicators at the front of the pipeline and not at the back as an afterthought. Because I think that happens all the time when the people at the front of the agency are more focused on the engineering and the technical side of it, which they should be. It's an important part of an overall uh, space mission. But those softer skills and the folks in the communications area are vitally important to connecting with their audiences. And it's easy for that to get lost in the rush up to a launch or a program. It's funny you mentioned that because I noticed after like, you know, last year, the worm started coming back. Like you started seeing that iconography again that you hadn't seen in for ages. So that's really cool. Back to marketing the moon. There's a lot of gems in that book that I'd never that I'd never seen before, uh, such as the, the singing uh, quartet. I think it was the fearsome foursome, which was yeah. Conrad, uh, Gordon, Young and uh, Stafford. Oh, where did you ever find these things? You know, uh, a big thing with uh, writing Marketing the Moon that I love and the memories that I have are talking to people like Jack King, Doug Ward, all the famous public affairs people who worked either at the Cape or down in Houston, 
um, who weren't used to people asking them about their stories, asking them about what happened behind the scenes. Everybody wants to know about the astronauts themselves, but David and I were these marketing and communication geeks. And so we went to them as the source and uh, they were sharp as a tack, right? And, and so we got all of those stories from the people behind the scenes who put together the Escape Velocity uh, Press Club and those areas that hosted those parties and did those things. Um, and uh, it was just a, a, an unending number of stories. And I have to tell you, you know, Marketing the Moon was a, was a fun project, but there's still so much on the cutting room floor from that uh, that uh, I'm sure many, many more books could be written. And hopefully they will be someday. All right. So now on to George Lowe. Uh, the subject of the ultimate engineer. So why do you think it took so long for this NASA legend to get his own biography? And uh, for those who don't know who he is, can you give maybe a short Cliff Notes uh, introduction as to who he was? Sure, absolutely. Um, for those who don't know him, I, I view George Lowe as kind of the heart and soul of NASA, even from its earliest days. He's kind of the ghost in the machine. Uh, one of those uh, maybe top five people that without George in the positions he was in, without his contributions, it's it's arguable that NASA might not have even formed the way it did. And, and, and even going to the moon probably would not have been a goal of NASA's when it was and when it needed to be for Kennedy to seize upon it. And uh, George is one of these larger than life figures behind the scenes that didn't really court public uh, attention uh, that was one of these uh, quiet people, but huge influencers, uh, thought leaders, and decision makers um, that really, from the earliest days of NASA, before NASA was even NASA, at the NACA, when folks like Abe Silverstein uh, uh, and others were thinking about what the missions for NASA should be, they tapped into people like George uh, for ideas. And George was a contemporary of people like Faget and Gil Ruth and Chris Kraft and the others. Uh, but George had a, a leadership style, uh, a management philosophy, and an engineer's understanding that together made him the perfect person for NASA to be in the right place at the right time, uh, whether it was coming up with a mission for this nascent agency, whether it was uh, rebuilding the spacecraft after the Apollo 1 fire, whether it was making the bold decisions like going for the moon on Apollo 8 when the LEM wasn't ready, uh, or whether it was uh, seeing the program through to the Apollo 11 moon landing, or being the administrator who is probably most responsible for NASA surviving in that immediate aftermath of a post-Apollo world. I mean, that's George Lowe. I have to say that in writing this book and researching this book, uh, it took me about five years from start to finish. Every week, every month, I pinched myself and said, I can't believe, number one, this hasn't been done before. And number two, oh, my God, if I don't finish it now, somebody's going to beat me to it by next <laughs> week because he's just too big, too important. Why hasn't somebody done this? I can't answer the why. I I don't know. All I can say is that I'm incredibly honored that it was me. Um, I, I probably think that maybe George and some other historians probably wish it would have been somebody else, uh, <laughs> so maybe somebody a little bit more talented. But uh, I have to say, no. I tried to channel Lowe's story in a way that would give people the highlights to not only understand and appreciate his contributions, but to want to research more to learn more about him, his engineering philosophies, his management philosophies, uh, his importance as an educator and a teacher post-Apollo, post-NASA. Um, and uh, I've gotten a lot of uh, gratifying feedback that a lot of that's going on. So uh, again, I was thrilled and honored to do it. Uh, personally, as somebody who writes about space, I'm really interested in finding out more about him in that transitional period in the 70s between Apollo and the shuttle, because that was kind of a 
a, re a weird time, <laughs> you know, in NASA history where they were sort of like, we're doing this thing, but we don't really know what we're doing, you know, and it's so uh, I think you did sort of all of us a service. <laughs> Thank you. You did the yeah. rest of us a service. You know, for me, those were the most interesting part, uh, chapters to write were the post-Apollo chapters, because like most children of Apollo, I've read all the Apollo books mm -hmm. and I didn't want uh, the Loeb book to focus on the stories we all know. Right. And and, and spend all my time re-describing Apollo 11 and re-describing Apollo 8. But I really wanted to give the readers something new. I have to say anybody interested in this period. You must go to the George Lowe archives at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy. Lowe kept a daily diary, daily diary oh my God. of his thoughts, his actions, and being the consummate organized person he was, attached all the background memos and material to each of those. I spent weeks going through and I could spend years because you start reading one memo and you go down the rabbit hole of, oh, my God, I didn't know this. And you just start reading it. George has done a service by simply keeping all this material. And uh, I know a number of researchers who have mined it and they all come away with the same attitude, which is, oh, my God, I had no idea. Um, so I, 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 anyone who wants to research those area, eras and those years really are missing the big picture if they do not plumb the George Lowe uh, archive at RPI. Oh, God, I have to go there now. <laughs> I got to go there. <laughs> I, I have a perhaps a bigger a bigger picture question about that. How comes that kind of thing hasn't been digitalized and put online, even if it's put behind a paywall, or, or has it been? Uh, some of it has been, um, uh, but a lot of it, you know, most research libraries and most uh, archives at universities are not funded the way, you know, Amazon or Google Books is funded, and uh, it's it's priorities. It's also a treasure for them. Yeah. And true diehard researchers and academics know how to access it. Uh, but it's very difficult for, for the average public. I, I do understand in talking to them that they have projects afoot to digitize things. What they have done, though, uh, for those who are in the New York area or who will be visiting that area, they have all of George's personal memorabilia. Uh, flags and Robbins medallions, awards, personal items, and you name it, in a museum display in their engineering building. It's uh, it's on the third floor. It's an entire floor. And you walk around and it's got his official NASA portrait. And then you go through and it tells his whole life story with all the original documents. And it's a permanent display that is just uh, beyond anything I've seen in any museum about Lowe. Uh, and so between the archives uh, and all of his dusty memos and diaries uh, and that museum exhibit of his, it's, it's a must stop. It's a hidden gem. Uh, and yes, I, I do hope it's digitized. One of the things that I wish would be digitized when he became the Apollo one program manager, one of the problems that he quickly assessed was there was a breakdown in communication on engineering changes and other things going on. And Bob Gilruth was kept out of the decision-making process. Gilruth headed up down in Houston, but folks were going above Gilruth to Washington. And so uh, Lowe said, I brought Gilruth back in the conversation. I wrote him a memo every day about every decision every conversation, every problem, every area of focus. And these aren't war and peace uh, novels. These are two and three page memos, sometimes a little longer depending on the issue. But it spells out everything. And he brought the entire organization down in Houston back into the conversation uh, so that they could get a handle on all the problems around the spacecraft. And that in itself, if that was ever digitized, is just fascinating reading. I mean, I, 
I break down the Apollo 8 decision through those memos in uh, The Ultimate Engineer. And that level of detail on, on, on the work on the switches and uh, the work going out uh, uh, down at Grummond and, 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 uh, and elsewhere, all of that comes from out of his notes. And uh, it's as if Lowe uh, was talking to you directly. It's, it's fascinating. You know, this conversation just gets me incredibly frustrated that more people don't know who George Lowe is. He's such an important part of, of this era of history, uh, and yet his name isn't well widely known. And do you know what? He probably is happy with that, so maybe I shouldn't be frustrated. But are there lessons in leadership uh, which people could learn from George Lowe even today, 30 years after he died? Yeah. I think there's a there's a number of things uh, from his style of management that I think many people can learn from. I think one of the biggest things is his desire to bring the right people into the conversation and keep a broader view of what's going on. You know, he he had a phenomenal attention to detail, but he never convinced himself that he was the smartest person in the room. He knew his limitations. Um, and so he tried to bring in a broad conversation. The other thing is George Lowe was not a desk jockey. He did not hide behind memos and the phone in his office, but he was a what he called a dirty hands engineer. He went out on the shop floor. He spent his lunch hours sitting down with the flight controllers and going into the people in the checkout rooms and other places and just asking them questions. Uh, he'd break open his sandwich and just say, so what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Um, and he would go to the front line, not rely on the memos that would roll up and get uh, washed and cleansed for political reasons by the time it, it, it reached his desk. But he also knew his limitations, too, and he had trusted lieutenants. Uh, one of the things that people like Kraft, uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing Chris Kraft for this book. I had the pleasure of interviewing a number of people who worked with Lowe, Glenn Lunny, uh, Jerry Griffin, uh, just amazing, amazing people. And uh, all of them said that uh, he listened first. But then when he made a decision, it was final. He didn't go behind his back. He didn't make a decision in the room and, and then change it later. Everyone was on the same page and ran to the same marching orders. I think if somebody like George Lowe was still in the agency, I think there was a good chance that the Challenger uh, and the Columbia disasters might not have happened the way they happened. Wow. And I heard that from so many people that Lowe's command of the risk management process after the Apollo 1 fire, it was gospel. Nothing was allowed to violate. And when, when he left the agency, you look at the, the notes from very senior people who today many of us respect that said, George, I don't know how we're going to prevent loss of life without people like you at the agency. Because he, he, he drove that to the core. And I think when you don't have people with that fiduciary sense of responsibility like a George Lowe had, somebody who understood the ultimate life and death calculated risks that are being made at the bigger level, um, it's easy for people to make shortcuts and to say, well, my little decision here isn't going to matter because somebody else might catch it. No, every decision matters. Uh, one of the key points to that, I was going through his memos, and I read where when they were redesigning the space capsule after the Apollo 1 fire, they wanted to take out the carbon monoxide detector. People were like, hey, you don't need that. Just take it out. It's less weight. We don't need it. And I wonder how Apollo 13 would have gone had the carbon monoxide detector been taken out. Would somebody had stumbled upon and thought about scrubbing the air on uh, on their capsule during the return early enough if those detectors weren't there. You never know what cascading effect of those decisions will have. But by focusing on those details and keeping safety uh, sacrosanct, you're going to lose your way. And I think 
Many people that you talk to during the shuttle eras of those two horrible accidents will say NASA lost its way. And each time when they say they lost their way, I always ask, well, what do you mean by that? And it's usually, well, we forgot the lessons of the past. We didn't have the controls in place. We had go fever. The, the schedules and the budgets overrode good risk management decisions. Mm. So I do think a lot of lessons can be learned. Yeah, absolutely. And from that very serious subject, I would like to to change tack slightly into something which may appear a bit trivial, but I find it fascinating. I couldn't let this interview end without asking you about the Jefferson Space Museum. <laughs> this is just amazing, right? Because I am a geek and I like collecting things. And I think most people who get into space become a collector of some item or another and you have stumbled upon two dollar bills that have flown into space and have made the most epic collection and i want to know more about it tell us how it started and why it's important so not only being a child of the apollo generation i was i was very much around and cognizant in 1976 around the bicentennial and the reintroduction of the two dollar bill uh and as a kid geeked out over it, right? And <laughs> so everyone thought, go out and get a $2 bill, put it in your drawer. 20 years from now, it's going to be worth millions of dollars. You're going to retire. And, you know, you jump ahead and a $2 bill is worth maybe $2.05 uh, historically. But, you know, with inflation, it's probably actually worth, you know, 25 cents or 50 cents. And it was it just really a letdown. And um, but for me, just like uh, Apollo, I had an emotional connection to the $2 bill. I, it, just, it, it is what it is, because I was around when they were reissued. Fast forward then to uh, one of the space auctions maybe 15, 20 years ago, and the wonderful crew, one of my favorite crews, uh, Apollo 15, right? You know, our great friend Al Warden and, 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 and Dave Scott and uh, Jim Irwin. They took $2 bills on that mission. And uh, those sometimes pop up in auctions. And so when I saw it, I'm like, I have to have one. And so I got it. And then it became like a potato chip, though, because then I started to see other $2 bills pop up at auction. Uh, you know, John Glenn's flight had famously a bunch of $2 bills that the ground support crew secreted on those missions by wrapping it around the wiring in the spacecraft wow. and writing little messages to them. Uh, uh, and uh, it spawned a whole congressional investigation. But I saw one of those. I'm like, oh, got to have it. Got to be the top bidder on that. <laughs> and I started to see this pattern and I couldn't believe it. And Gordon Cooper took a $2 bill, right? Uh, for his 22 orbits. But it wasn't just a normal $2 bill. It was one of these 1917 large format dollar bills. It's almost like a flag. It's so big. And um, crews in Gemini started taking $2 bills because it was a two-person crew. And boy, the $2 <laughs> bill uh, is great. Uh, and then uh, from Gunter Vent, I got his $2 bill that Pete Conrad and Gordon Cooper, the two of the greatest jokesters ever, uh, they took two $2 bills and they cut them in half. They signed them and they cut them in half and they gave one half to Gunter on the launch pad and said, this is $1 down. <laughs> and then they took the other $2 and after splashdown, gave it back to him to complete it uh, as uh, the full set of the $2 bills. So I have the two cut uh, $2 bills signed and with, with a note from Gunter spelling out the story of one of their famous gotchas uh, of, of Amazing. turning $2 bills into $1 bills. So uh, I have arguably the world's largest, but the most important to me and probably the one item that I would take out of the house in the, in the case of a fire. If there was one space item I would take, it would be Gene Cernan's uh, $2 bill that I have. Um, wow. uh, I found out about Gene's $2 bill by accident. I was writing freedom of information requests into NASA researching a subject because, you know, I'm a geek and that's what I do. And I wanted to try and find out about what was in the PPK lists of the astronauts. Uh, and of course, NASA never releases that information. However, my letter landed on an intern's desk on a day that the person in charge of that information was on vacation. 
<laughs> and she sent me the PPK list of Apollo 17. And I looked at it and not only were my hands shaking when I opened that envelope <laughs> and I was looking at it, uh, because I was aware of the story that because of Apollo 15, there was a huge crackdown and the astronauts on Apollo 17 could only take 12 items, 12 items, no more, no less. That's well, Gene Cernan being Gene Cernan uh, appealed to George Lowe and the others. And he said, how about if one of my 12 items is a vacuum packed item? <laughs> I'm like, well, that's one. Okay. So Gene stuffed a bunch of things in a vacuum pack, and that became one item on his PPK list. And on that list, it listed a bunch of things, and, and, and it was as if it jumped out of me at like a cartoon character, boing, boing, $2 bill flown <laughs> on Gemini and Apollo 10. And I, I, uh, I almost lost my mind. Um, and so being the geek that I am, I wrote Gene a very impassioned letter. And I said, I'm not going to tell you how or why, et cetera, but I know you took a $2 bill. I know you took a $2 bill on all of your missions. My question for you is number one, do you have it? And number two, can I have it? Can I, can I get it from you? Um, I was at work. I was actually in this office 12 years ago. And the phone rang and it was Gene Cernan. He tracked oh me down. God. He he called my wife. My wife gave him my work number. Shot the front door. <laughs> and and he called me and he grilled me on the PPK story. I told him. <laughs> um, and then we started a really interesting discussion. Well, he he grew up not far from where I work. I work in, in Oak Brook, Illinois, and uh, he grew up in Maywood, Illinois. And uh, he knew I had this $2 bill collection. He was a $2 bill <laughs> fanatic. He always carried a $2 <laughs> bill in his back pocket this is anywhere amazing. he went. In fact, whenever I would see him after that, he would take out his wallet and he would take out a dirty, rotten, tattered $2 bill. And he'd go, I've had this one in my back pocket for like seven years. Um <laughs> And I asked him, where did this tradition come from? And he said it was from my father. The bill that I now own, that Gene entrusted to me to be custodian of for future generations, is a $2 bill that his father used to keep in his own wallet when he would go to work, and he would keep it for good luck. And when Gene was flying on Gemini 9, he gave it to Gene as a good luck talisman to take with him. And as we all know, on that flight, Gene almost died during his spacewalk. Tom Stafford had considered almost cutting him loose because Gene had, had, had lost control. He had about 10 buckets of sweat in his boot from all the exertion and the effort. Um, and in many ways, I think uh, Gene Cernan attributed some luck to that $2 bill of getting back alive. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Gene told me his father died before he could give the $2 bill back to him. And so for Gene, uh, it became a memento to him of his hero. As he said, you, sometimes we never know who our heroes are until they're gone. And for him, his father was a hero. And so on Apollo 10, he took that bill with him. He didn't just take it with him. He, he carried it on him. So it was in his spacesuit pocket. So when he and Stafford were barnstorming the moon in the lunar module, a switch was flipped and they, they almost lost control for a brief second, right? It, it was almost catastrophe, but they seized control. They solved it, you know, mission accomplished, came back during that dress rehearsal for Apollo 11. And Gene sort of thought, well, geez, save my life on nine, Gemini nine, save my life on 10. I better take this with me on 17. <laughs> And uh, so not only did he take it with him, but he took it down to the surface with him. So it is it is uh, one of the few, if not the only two dollar bills that has flown in Earth orbit. In lunar orbit and then down to the lunar surface on wow. three separate missions uh, and returned to Earth. And Gene certified it on the bill, wrote me letters at Tom Stafford's 70th anniversary birthday party in Weatherford, Oklahoma. I was there. 
with a bunch of other folks and Neil Armstrong showed up for that birthday party and, and Gene showed up and a bunch of other people. I had some time in Gene's hotel room with him and I filmed him talking about the $2 bill. Uh, and he talked about all his personal things. He has a, um, he told me that <laughs> the PPK lists are, are so incomplete in many cases. He said, for example, and he just pulls this out. He goes, I got this St. Christopher's medal, this, this uh, Our Lady of Loretto, the patron saint of flight. I, I have this medal, flew with me on every one of my missions. It's not on any PPK list, but it's here. I never take it off. I don't even take it off the shower, he said, but this flew with me. And so uh, we talked about that. He told me the story of the $2 bill. And um, he said, you're probably the only person on the planet who is as passionate for these $2 bills as I am. And so he, he transferred custody to me. Uh, and I also got one of those tattered $2 bills he kept in his wallet. too. <laughs> uh, he gave me one of those. And so, um, I, wow. Uh, That's awesome. I, I had to keep building the Jefferson space museum as a tribute to that. And, and the theme of these. And so they sit in a safety deposit box for obvious reasons. And so I built that website uh, as a virtual museum so others can enjoy it, so I can enjoy it without having to, to tear them out of the safety deposit box uh, and to display those $2 bills. And I, I get tons of traffic every month. Uh, it led to me being in the $2 bill documentary and, and, and yeah. talking about those bills. Great documentary. Yes. Excellent. It was interesting, wasn't it? Quirky, yeah. but great. Uh, I learned a lot from that. So anyway, that's the story of the $2 bills. and. Uh, it even goes up to this day. I sent a $2 bill into the club for the future. Uh, Bezos is, uh, hey, kids, we'll send stuff into space. And I wrote them a note and I said, look, go to the website, look at it. I'm not going to pretend I'm some teacher or anything. I'm not. But I, 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 I would love to have a $2 bill that goes up in space and I will share it with people. I will, I will, I will talk about it. Uh, and if you can't send it, I understand uh, don't send it back. Maybe buy some ice cream with it. Do something <laughs> with it. But if you can, send it. And after New, Sh it, it went on, uh, I believe, New Shepherd 13. And uh, when it came back, uh, it was stamped Club of the Future. They even wrote me a little note with the serial number on it saying this flew in space, uh, oh, wow. blah, blah, blah. So uh, even private space is now taking uh, the $2 bills with them and uh, becoming part of the Jefferson Space Museum. What a tradition. That is awesome. What a tradition. That is awesome. May the geeks inherit the earth. Yes. May the geeks inherit the earth. Yes, absolutely. It's such a strange thing, isn't it? Because I, you know, I've got a load of different things that I collect. I've even got a few two dollar bills here. Really? Uh, funnily enough. Um, but there is something, isn't there, about collecting things. Money in particular. I've got money from all over the world, places I've even been to. I've got these notes. I I don't even know why. It's crazy. Well, yeah, and I and I don't know and it uh I don't know if you read the piece I did for uh, the Smithsonian's website on the uh, the dollar bills used to certify flights. I did read that um, today, but, actually. <laughs> but, you know that that tradition of using dollar bills to certify to to particularly in the early days when there was no television camera aboard, and they wanted to to you know verify who went in the capsule and who came out of the capsule were one and the same person. I think is wrapped up in this tradition of astronauts being fighter pilots and taking short snorters uh, during World War II and, 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 and the Korean War and other wars. You know, I understand that uh, U-2 plane pilots uh, also have ceremonial $2 bills uh, and they're signed by the crews and they have their first flight $2 bills that they take with. And so this idea of currency as a national symbol, as a crew symbol, as something that touches on the military heritage, uh, personal connections and good luck uh, and uh, everything in between. Uh, there's something very special about that as, as a private memento. And uh, I just find it fascinating that the astronauts uh, included that. You know, many of them were collectors. Yeah. Uh, many of them were stamp collectors and envelope collectors and coin collectors. Uh, even in researching the George Lowe archive, he's got letters in there where he's sending pictures. George Lowe is sending pictures to Nixon or sending pictures down to other people asking them to autograph them for him, right? <laughs> so that's, um, that's hysterical. You, had, you had other administrators asking people for other things. And we all want to collect. We all have 
things that mean something to us uh, that we want to hold on to. They might be meaningless to somebody else, but to us, they mean everything. Absolutely. 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 Well, Richard, this is this has gone in many places I didn't expect it to go, but I've loved every second of it. So thank you very much for joining us today uh, and giving us your time. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I hope it, uh, it has some value for your listeners. And uh, I love what you guys do with the show. Oh, thank um, you very much. Very passionate thank about you. it. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing my pin. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Well, I'm sure we'll have you back on again sometime. Thanks, Richard. Hello, Houston. Apollo 15. The Falcon is on its perch. Now, let me tell you, there were many times during that interview where both Emily and I had wide mouths and were kind of shocked. And I had to edit out a lot of <gasps> gasps because we were both so surprised at where some of those stories ended up. Absolutely amazing. I'm just blown away by how much fun that was. Yeah, the, uh, my jaw was on the ground for a, a few times. Uh, all I know now is I need to go to uh, RPI and uh, <laughs> and I need to go through their his archives because... Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of hilarious stuff in there as well because I have a I've seen a few of his memos uh, that I did for a, a story I wrote like a year ago. It was about the Apollo 13, uh, the awful movie that was done on television. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, that was one of his memos, <laughs> yes. wasn't it? I remember when we talked about that in the podcast. Yeah, the um, awful film that was done in the 70s about Apollo 13, and um, Jim Lovell was quite upset about it. And wrote, I actually wrote like NASA about it, and um, I George Lowe was like the one trying to you know sort of deal with it, and I I just think some of his notes were hilarious because you can kind of tell he's like, can someone else please deal with this you know this mess right now, <laughs> you know you could tell he was just kind of like oh dear you know like crap, but for what it's worth I don't know if this had anything to do with him. They never did a movie like that in like Mission Control again. <laughs> Yeah. So maybe they, maybe that was it. You know. <laughs> well, well, based on what Richard was saying there about his attention to detail, maybe he did put a bit more detail in the rules of what could happen in Mission Control. Who knows? Exactly. Yeah. Well, we're gonna film no crappy TV films in here ever again. Like I don't know. Maybe there was a rule put in there or something. I have no idea. But um, yeah, I'd I'd love to go through those memos, especially the ones from the mid seventies period. That. That okay. Now I need to. Now that's a trip that I need to do. That's been put on the uh, inventory of things I need to do once uh, I save up more money. So yeah. Well, when, yeah. I mean, you've already got to go and visit Enterprise in New York as well. So you know, it, it makes sense to uh, true to try and put a whole piece, the whole trip together in New York. Also, I thoroughly recommend the Cradle of Aviation Museum out in Long Island as well. You've got to get there. They've got all the lunar module grammar and stuff. It's amazing. Exactly. Anyway. Um, yeah, Richard was amazing there. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful interview that. Um, so if you want to watch the full unedited interview, and you probably do because there's loads in there. Yes. The marketing stuff, the George Lowe stuff, and then so much cool stuff about $2 bills and collecting things. It was amazing. It was such a varied conversation. Uh, and a massive thank you for him for joining us. But go and check out our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things, uh, where you can... Uh, Watch that full video. You know, he even gave us a plug for our pin. If you want a pin, get yourself a pin. They're on our website as well. Or, or sign up to our Patreon and you'll get one. So there you go. Uh, but thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. And The Ultimate Engineer is out on paperback in November. Yes. Make sure if you haven't got it yet, you can get a paperback version. You got to read it. I think I've reviewed it twice. <laughs> I reviewed it uh, with Dwayne Day for the Space Review. And I re uh, I've also reviewed it for the NSS, my, my blog. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh... It's a it's a fine book. You you all really need to read it. I, I'm I'm honestly like and and Richard talked about this a little bit. I'm honestly surprised nobody did this before him. You know because I was like, man, he's such a big deal in NASA history. Like, why has nobody done this? But it was worth the wait. It's an excellent book. Yeah. So go get it. Uh, maybe it's because he hasn't been portrayed in a in a film or a TV series in 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 the way. So he hasn't his name isn't necessarily in popular culture, even though it's in the in the in the history books uh, and we've heard it because we've read all those books but uh it's not there in popular culture is he no perhaps because he was the quiet man yeah i think it, i think there's a few reasons i think it was yeah i think what you said is probably why because he was very quiet he didn't really court the spotlight he wasn't really a flashy 
type person. Like if you look at Chris Craft, you're like, okay, that's Chris Craft, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Chris Craft. Like with George Lowe, he was very like I don't want to say nondescript, but he was he was kind of just a nice guy, you know. He was sort of you know he just kind of blended in, you know. And um, I watched an interview with him from the '70s once, I think, in a like a NASA history documentary, and I was shocked at how soft spoken he was like i expected him to be like you know craft or gil ruth or something like that he was very soft spoken i was really shocked i was like oh god i thought this guy was like a real beast and meanwhile he was <laughs> really like you know very soft spoken guy very you know not like chris craft at all we'll just put it that way just uh chris craft was you know yeah if you've seen an interview with him you y'all know what he was like so, um, and another thing is, I think because he died really young, he was only 58 when he died, I believe. And, um, it's really sad. He, he, I, I think he got skin cancer in his forties and he got like experimental treatment for it. And, um, that kept it away for like 10 years, which for the the seventies is really amazing. Um, but then he got it, you know, it came back in, in the eighties. So, um, but he passed away when he was pretty young and i think that's partially why is just people this is i hate saying this because it's so true like the further i look back at certain things i'm like people just forget about stuff you know yeah. they just forget about certain people like you know and the person could have been like a superstar you know at what they did and it's like if they die young it's like people tend to just not remember it as much and it just that's why I'm glad you got people like, you know, Richard who are out there writing about this stuff and like, hey, remember this person, you know, let's talk about this. And I'm like uh, that. I'm very grateful for that as somebody who writes about space, because it's like we need to keep that that information going, you know. Absolutely. Well, great interview. And I hope you've enjoyed that. The door is opening now and it's pretty incredible. And so on to this week's news, which is obviously dominated by the success of the Inspiration4 mission, which we covered uh, in depth last week with our reaction to the launch. But it's great to see that they made it home safely on Saturday, the 18th of September, after three days in space. All went well on the mission, and uh, they spent their time on science projects and taking photos and videos in, from their incredible incredible cupola cupola Vit well we, we still don't know we still don't know <laughs> francis francis Ford food cupola. yep exactly uh, <laughs> as well as having video calls with the patients at st jude's children research hospital uh, as well as completing the space mission they have also successfully raised over 200 million dollars for the hospital with still more money coming in uh, there's a number of flown items now up for auction which will bring a lot more money in and uh, i said it last week but i've been blown away by this mission and and this crew. Since they've got back, we've seen them go out and visit their Falcon 9 first stage booster rocket on board the drone ship. Just read the instructions. And they had the most epic looking splashdown party ever last night. It looked amazing. It did. Um, so I, I've been keeping up to date with all their actions on social media. And it's been great seeing them interact with the many people who have got in touch over the course of their mission. I'm fairly sure that Jared hasn't been to sleep uh, since he got back. Because he's been so busy either doing things, which which we've been seeing, media events and stuff, or liking and responding to tweets. In fact, I tweeted him and asked him about this lack of sleep, and he replied saying, I will get to it at some point. And I believe him. I believe him that he hasn't done it yet, but he will do. But this has been amazing. And literally just before we started recording today, Dr. Cyan Proctor posted the video of when they opened the hatch to the Capola, the, to the Francis Ford. And um, <laughs> it was such an amazing video. Oh my God, I must have watched it about 15 times in a row. It's just incredible. Jared, I think it's Jared, in the, in the background, you can hear him going, holy sh... And I've always said, if you put regular people up in space, you will get the kind of reaction that will make it more real for the, for the everyday person. And I think his reaction to that is exactly what I've been saying for years. Send real people up there. Send send non-NASA trained people up there that, that aren't there doing checklist stuff who are actually got a bit more perspective. And that's nothing against NASA astronauts, but they're just so incredibly trained to be doing their job that they often forget about the human response because they're busy doing other things. And even, even Haley in this video is busy trying, at first she's like, oh, I need to be doing a job. 
I need to be covering up the the hatch rim. And she starts doing it and then then just stops because she's then just staring at the view. And it's incredible. You have to see this video. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, oh, my gosh. I've been having uh, I've been having these dreams, man, where like I get a ride up there and I get to stare oh, at it. Oh, my God. Yeah. Stuff. Like, I mean, the dreams are pretty good. I'm not complaining. I'll take the dreams if I can't <laughs> get a real flight. I'll take it. But yeah, it just looked amazing. And like you said, I, I love the fact that they express their joy over it because like, I mean, not, and like you said, you know, nothing against professional, you know, NASA, when I say professional, I mean, like nothing against agency astronauts, but. I'm sure they have to go undergo like charm school, you know, some kind of charm school or some kind of training. Like, okay, you can't do, you can't say a cuss up there. You can't, you know, do anything funny up there. You know, I, it, it'll make our agency look bad type of thing. And I understand, but at the same time, it's like, I don't understand how anybody could go on a rocket, launch to space, go through that experience. Right. Which is nuts. And then survive, you know, survive that. They made it safe, but still, that's probably like a oh crap, oh crap, oh crap experience, you know, where you're a little nervous. And then you finally get to space and you look out the window and see the Earth for the first time and how beautiful it is and how just mind boggling it is and not say, you know, holy sh. Yeah, you know, exactly. I would be saying it. I would probably be saying more stuff too, <laughs> you know, but. Yeah, I don't see how anybody could go up there and see the Earth and not say that, you know, or see those visions because not everyone's going to get that opportunity. But also, it's just like the foreignness of that vision, you know. I mean, yeah. I'd probably be saying a lot of stuff, but I agree with you. I love the human element of it and the excitement. I thought that was wonderful. And we're going to get more. Yeah, which we've got all the way through the video of them during the launch, as we spoke about last week. But uh, as they were strapped in, getting ready to come back, uh, Chris, obviously, his job and duty was done. He's sitting there watching Spaceballs on a, on a tablet. It's things like that which just make them so human. So uh, maybe maybe astronauts used to do that kind of thing, but we didn't see it. And now we're, you know, now we're seeing and, and, and getting those experiences. It's wonderful. I didn't know whether to bring this up, but there was a lot of chat people frustrated about the fact that when they are up there we won't hear him much from them uh and it didn't bother me at all i was bothered by people bringing it up rather than being bothered by the, the lack of contact because i knew we'd get it as soon as cyan has posted this video it's done exactly what we wanted it to do it didn't have to happen at the time like people need yeah. patience i figured because um the tedris network i'm not suggesting that it's overextended or anything but you know, the Tedris carries a lot of stuff. It carries uh, military stuff. It carries stuff in Antarctica. Yeah. It carries the ISS. It carries probably a number of other things as well. It's probably so large that, you know, I think their um, their spacecraft could only get really voice and data. I, I hate to say it, going to space isn't like, you know, just bringing your iPhone and being like, yo, I got Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's just like, it's not like that. Um According to uh, Spaceflight Now, they only had a video when they went over a ground station. We still have ground stations, yeah. even in 2021, you know, for that those kind of reasons. Yeah, so I, I totally understood why they weren't sending down live video. In fact, I don't think there's ever been a NASA mission that's had 24-7 live video. Yeah. And why would you want that? I do not want that because that's going to involve, you know, Hey, I gotta go to the bathroom. Like, I don't want to see that. I'm sorry. I'd rather that be a mystery. Yeah, I, I I agree. Perhaps the only thing I will say, Jared ended up tweeting about it when he got back, just uh, that they didn't have access to those kind of things on this mission uh, and, and said it exactly as it was. The only thing I think they perhaps should have done beforehand is perhaps say, look, you're not going to hear from us while we're up there. I think if they'd sent that tweet out, it may have just, and, and explained why, it may have stopped some of the debate, which was unnecessary, and uh, and put a blight yeah, on, my, on my few days of just wanting to enjoy the fact that I knew they were up there. I was just glad they were up, they were safe, and they were up there, they were safe, they were. They seemed healthy and smiling. And, and when, when those parachutes opened, ugh. I know, that's all I cared about, and they seemed to be fine, so that was all good, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, I agree. I was kind of just like everybody just chill. Like just chill. They'll 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 be video. You just got to wait for it. And wait, we have and uh, the video has arrived and it's great and there's more to come, which is great. But there's one other thing. There is the element of privacy as well. Just 
we don't need to see them preparing to use the bathroom. That's a small contained space. Uh, we don't need that. And uh, actually, the bathroom was one of the issues they had. Um, it's been reported that there was a couple of issues with the bathroom. And Elon has tweeted saying that for future tourist flights in Dragon, they're going to work on the bathroom. They're going to work on providing uh, ways to have hot food and 4G Wi-Fi. <laughs> Which would be nuts in space, yeah. Because then they could send down some photos and videos from anywhere. But I still think we're probably a little bit away, way away from that. Yeah. For everyone, everyone who was like, Starlink, uh, Starlink isn't even operational yet. Yeah, it's not even. You know, it, it's up there. It's, it's up there, but it's not even fully like built yet so yeah exactly you can't you know and it, i don't know if it has the capability to do that yet and they were and they were above it and there's not yet got the yeah. <laughs> and, and it's ground facing anyway there's a uh, lot of things that i i feel yeah. like people forgot <laughs> you know because i was yeah. think i was thinking about it last week when they went up when when it started because i was like they probably have you know they're competing with a bunch of other people for tedris so yeah. it's not like they probably can have constant, you know, a live video or something like that. That doesn't make sense, you know? No, absolutely not. And I, uh, you know, I thought we got good updates as the mission went on. We got a few more little bits. We saw some of the, the stuff of them talking to the to the kids, which was amazing. Yes. Uh, you know, and that's what this mission was about at the end of the day. It wasn't about you and I to the extent. It was about those kids in that hospital. It really was. Exactly. And, uh, and I think a few people forgot that as well. Yeah, I'm hoping if anything comes from this, I mean, it's not just four people going to space. I'm hoping there's more research to cure pediatric cancer, you know, because when you're an adult and you find out you have it, that sucks. But you're an adult, you know, it, it's a little emotionally easier to deal with because you're like, oh, I've, I've kind of lived part of my life. You know, when you're in a when you're a, I can't imagine having a child going through that. You know, yeah. and I think I, I do think that's important. We need to look for a cure. And I think people have kind of forgotten about it. So I if nothing else comes from this, I'm hoping, you know, a lot of research will come out of this. That would be wonderful. Yeah. And Haley's leg held up. Awesome. Which is important. Awesome. It's great. That gives hope to anybody who's gone through this. You know that. Absolutely. Okay, your body can take this just fine. <laughs> Like yeah. that gives someone. I have a lot of hope now. I'll be real. I'm still praying to God I can get a ride on one of these someday. Somehow, I think you will. I think you might. Maybe do. we'll see. Anyway, moving on. One of the things we didn't mention last week was that a result of this mission, for the first time ever, there were 14 people in orbit at the same time, which is a new record. Although the three Chinese uh, taikonauts, I think that's how it said, taikonauts return home on Friday, uh, September 17th, after spending three months on board the core module of the new Chinese space station. Uh, this was the longest crewed Chinese mission ever, three times longer than the previous record. And on Monday, September 20th, the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, or CASC, had the only launch since our last recording with a launch of the Long March 7 rocket taking an automated cargo ship to their space station. This is in advance of the next crew going to the station sometime in October. And while we're talking about astronauts in space, NASA astronaut Mark van der Hey has had his current mission extended until March 2022, which will mean he will break Scott Kelly's 340-day record for the longest single space flight by an American astronaut. Uh, van der Hey was launched on a Soyuz rocket back in April of this year, and due to the short stay of two Russians who are going to be making a film on the space station next month, his seat to go home, along with the seat of his Russian crewmate Piotr Dubrov, will be given to the two filmmakers. Uh, this was always expected. They knew this mission was coming, uh, but the announcement has finally been made, and he seems quite excited by the idea, although he has said that he's medicating every day and speaking with his family almost every day in order to manage the isolation that comes with long-duration missions. Now, the medication thing is because, if you may remember a few weeks mm -hmm. ago, he had to not do an EVA because he's got a trapped nerve in his neck. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I think that's something to do with that. The last part of that where he said he's, you know, the, the issues with isolation and things like this, I think we're beginning to see more human elements from astronauts. As much as we said earlier about the, what we got from Inspiration4 crew, because Thomas Pesquet tweeted from space about Inspiration4. I don't know if you saw this. He said, congratulations, Inspiration4 and SpaceX. 
Going to space is never easy for anybody, though most of the time we insist on the positives and the fun parts for the camera and keep the pain, the sacrifices, the discomforts for ourselves. Uh, looking forward to hearing your stories one day. And I found that fascinating mm -hmm. that someone said that. And I think, obviously, Mark van der Hayes obviously hinting at that as well. Yeah. That it's not easy. It may be fun. It may be a lot. Of, it may be exciting. But equally, it's not easy. No. For example, these long duration astronauts have to be working out every day for about two hours. Yeah, two to four it's a hours. Lot of stuff they have to do. Yeah, crazy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I just remember in you know, obviously, um, Inspiration Four were they were only up for a few days, so physically it probably didn't have much of an effect on them. But I'll never forget this as long as I live. Um seeing Sergei Krikalov come out of uh, Soyuz when he came back. Yeah. He'd almost, he'd been up for like 10 months or something and they pulled him out and he just looked like a wet noodle. <laughs> I mean, he just, yeah. he just looked like he just had it. You know, he looked, you know, pale, exhausted. And this is somebody who works out all the time, who's really fit. So it's not easy on the human body, you know? And I think as the further we do these missions, you know, these long duration missions, you know, we're going to see how it affects the human body, maybe not so great way. So that that's something to definitely think about. Yeah, absolutely. We just take it for granted that they're all right up there, don't we? And that they're having a great time. We don't think about the, the sacrifices and the pain, as he says, and the yeah, discomfort. And mental. Yeah, exactly. It's tough. Absolutely. It was it was an inter just a nice little insight that, that we learned there. Yep, absolutely. In other news, NASA awarded $146 million dollars for human moon lander development, and it's being split into five different companies. Now, this is different to the 2.9 billion human landing system contract, which SpaceX was awarded earlier this year. According to the statement from NASA, the five companies chosen who are Blue Origin, Dynetics, uh, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and SpaceX will have 15 months to, and I quote, ultimately help shape the strategy and requirements for a future NASA solicitation to provide regular astronaut transportation from lunar orbit to the surface of the moon. So sort of like... I've got no idea. Sort of... I've got no maybe idea. Maybe sort of like that um, in For All Mankind where they had the, the lunar module, but it was it was like going from one place from, on the moon for another. I don't know. Something like that. Maybe. Something like maybe. that. Maybe. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Tracy Stevens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I think season three is coming yes! soon. Yes! Anyway, and finally, while talking about the future moon landings and the Artemis program, there have been some stunning photos posted of the Space Launch System, the SLS rocket, oh my which God, have been yeah. stacked together inside the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center. It looks to me like it's just waiting for the Orion space capsule now, and then it's good to go. I can't wait to see this thing fly. But wow, those vid those images. It's huge. It almost looks like CGI to me. It, I don't want to fuel people. It's not real. It's CGI <laughs> and stuff. It, it is real. But um, none of us in our generation have seen anything like that. So I got to see this thing fly. It's going to be incredible. Yeah. And that wraps us up for today. I have the fireflies. That's it for this week. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed something. And <laughs> I didn't mean to write that, but it's hilarious. Oh my god, I just saw that on the screen. I was like, what? What? Keep, <laughs> keep it in. Keep it in. Keep it in. Please keep it in. Wow, oh my god. Okay. I'm begging you to keep it in, please. Okay, I'll keep it in. We hope you enjoyed something. <laughs> I wish I'd put a question mark after it now. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you all right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, what a happy accident that was. <laughs> and don't forget to check out the show notes to learn more about any of today's stories or our wonderful guest, Richard Jurek. Uh, please check out his books if you have not already. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to hit that share button if you haven't already. But don't forget, in space, we hope you've enjoyed something. <laughs> <laughs> Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.